So I was listening in the car, Tom, to Spotify, and um, it's very clear there's been some budget cuts in the advertising space because loads of ads now sound like they're recorded on shit microphones in people's houses, much like this podcast. And Ex- speak for yourself. Well, no. well, yeah, you don't you don't tolerate this from me, and it makes <laughs> you really irritated. But what, in my defence? Professional advert advertisers with budgets to advertise on massively high profile podcasts uh, with millions of listeners are being recorded not even by by it sounds like professional voiceover artists and with really bad echoey sound quality and I have to say I have as we've been fiddling around for the last ten minutes with my microphone and setup here, I have a pretty amateur setup here, and you make it sound pretty good you're doing better than some some people putting out some very expensive adverts. Hey, listen, I am I'm just saying. I am just simply better than all of them. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, <laughs> yeah, for anyone who's interested, the era of Matt's bad mic is ending. I am giving him my old mic, which requires so much gain to even run. I don't think Matt can peak it. So rest <laughs> assured, you're gonna have very dulcet tones. Although. Uh, it will require Matt to talk directly into the mic, which he is not very good at. But with that out of the way, you're very welcome to Beneath the Skin, the show about the history of everything <laughs> told through the history of tattooing. I am one of your hosts, Thomas O'Mahony, and I am joined as ever by my delightful co-host, Dr. Matt Lauder. Oh, I'll take delightful. Thanks, Thomas. Mm-hmm. I don't um, think I've ever been called delightful before. You are delightful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Me and Matt are... Uh, we're doing our first ever photo shoot at the weekend, uh, so we can have some nice pictures of the two of us for the podcast. So first ever photo shoot together. I've, yeah, I've mod, I've, I, I modelled once for a for a, a a brand. Did you know that? No. Yeah, I modelled for a Barracuda. You know the like kind of Harrington jacket brand. I did a did a campaign with them once. <laughs> See, I've been approached. I've been approached. I've been yeah, approached. Yeah, listeners of this show, uh, we we would be remiss to forget. That Matt is actually famous, so um No, I'm not I'm not famous, I'm just shameless, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Different. Hey, listen, uh that is actually a very good segue of being shameless. <laughs> um today we're doing something that's uh quite interesting and we have an interesting way into it. Um we're talking about the history of Flash today. And to start us off, um I, as you may know, Matt isn't necessarily the best at responding to messages, but every now and then I will just get a message out of the blue very excitedly from Matt, and the other day was one of these cases. Yeah, so, um, I mean, look, fine, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, we all have our faults. I have very few, but, you know. Well, mine, my, I'm, I may be too modest. That's probably my mm-hmm. biggest failing. Um, anyway, um, simply, I'm not really. You're simply too handsome, Matt. I know that's what they. That's what they. That's what they say. Um, <laughs> so I'm not on uh, Twitter really anymore um, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but occasionally I get directed there by a, a, a news link from Reddit or something, and um, that will pop up. Uh, obviously, any unread messages and notifications that I've had since the last time I logged in, and actually. Uh, this um, was a notification I had. Uh, someone had added me into this a, f- a few weeks ago, and I hadn't seen it. But it was a post on um, on Twitter on X uh, by an account called uh, at Cairo Anatomica, um, and it's amazing and hilarious. And as you said, kind of a good way into um, this uh, theme, really. So this this account basically points out that um, they'd spotted lots of um, Copies of this design, uh, which was like half wolf face, like realistic black and gray, ha- half wolf, half wolf skull. Mm-hmm. Right. So a kind of, you know, a memento mori thing, you know, inside you, there are two wolves, one alive, one dead. I don't know how that goes, but and they're um, both kissing and they're both kissing. <laughs> um, but um, 
Yeah, so so this um this poster who's also on Instagram as well, um, who is a I think professional anatomist. Um their um Instagram bio reads anatomy propagandist and biology shit poster. I heart anatomy, pathology, and teratology. Um, so they they know what they're talking about, or at least you know claim to on the internet, which is good enough for me. And um, they point out that so quote I love this tattoo design because the message behind it is so unintentionally great. Um, they they find basically loads and loads of versions of this um, uh, design, not copies of each other, but the same theme, right? Half a realistic wolf, half a wolf skull. And she says, hey, this is hilarious because guess what? It isn't a wolf skull. And even in that um, thread, it, the same skull was being used for different animals as well. It. This is it, yeah. So this uh, account points out right, that this skull, <laughs> which is used over and over and over again by tattooers as a reference for a wolf skull, is actually a raccoon skull. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which is hilarious. So um, uh, they say basically uh, wolves wolves are chase predators. They identify a target and then tag team chase it until it gets tired and then tear it apart. They have wide cheekbones to anchor large, powerful jaw muscles. Mm -hmm. Um, But they point out that, yeah, um, they also have a weird pointy skull head, which doesn't actually look very much like a skull. It kind of looks weird. Mm-hmm. Wolf skulls, they say, have pointy tops, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and raccoon skulls, gone. And there's also an extra fault this because of like the uniqueness of the raccoon skull, which made them notice this in the first place. Is that the teeth are wrong on it for a wolf skull anatomy? Yeah, right. So the teeth, the teeth become this kind of become this clue, right? Um, so. Not only is this a, is this a raccoon skull that's used very frequently instead of a, a wolf skull, it's because of a particular kind of error with the dentition that gets repeated and repeated and repeated over and over again in all these tattoos. This person realised that these people must have been using these tattoo artists must have been using the same reference for this raccoon skull, and it turns out that yeah, it was it's from a, a Pinterest post of a photo of a raccoon skull. That is incorrectly labelled as a wolf skull, um, and um, basically, again, as this account points out, raccoon skulls do look better than wolf skulls from the front, um, and the compounding popularity from multiple searches has pushed it to the top of Google search for wolf skull front view. So, <laughs> so the top, the top Google image. And this is a, I'm going to use this as a teaching moment for my students as well. The top uh, image hit for a wolf skull front view is a raccoon skull. <laughs> this, yeah, it, it's kind of like this confluence of interesting po- like points of right now. One in terms of like how are artists going about designing Flash, but also like this strange mingling of technology in terms of like well when we look at like a lot of flash say with someone like Sutherland McDonald um, he was grabbing you know um, encyclopedias and books from the library and like tracing out of them and like there was this kind of active search to find reference images and then over time when you move into the middle of the 20th century people are using like photography and now where we're in a situation where you have ev- almost every image that could have ever existed at your fingertips but it's being filtered through this kind of SEO optimized thing. This is how you have an artist probably unintentionally typing in wolf skull front view and the number one result is a raccoon skull. Yeah. And I think this is, you know, this is, this is something that's come up uh, frequently on, on the, on the podcast, but will it's nice to focus on it specifically because it gives us an opportunity to talk about something that I go on about all the time. Um, which is this relationship between tattooing and the visual culture um, that surrounds it. Now, for those most people listening to this show, and, and uh, um, uh, it's pretty obvious in a way that tattooing is is kind of reflective of the images that people have around them. But it's not the way. That's not the way that most uh, anthropologists, for example, and sociologists have written about tattooing. Um, it's often it's often thought about as this separate thing, right? As this very separate practice. 
out here on its own in its own little universe. But of course, like the images that people tattoo on their bodies are the images that they have around them in their life world. And I guess that's what we want to talk about with with Flash. So um, what I want to, we'll start off by sort of talking about what Flash is, where that term comes from. And then maybe we can rewind um, right the way back to the 17th century um, and then sort of work forward from there. Um, mm. That sound all right? That sound good? Yep. Sounds perfect. So we, we, we talked about this when we covered um, Ink Master um, with the, the quote unquote Flash challenges, which some people online seems to misconstrue that, that Flash meant was used to, to talk about tattoo designs because it was quick. Um, flash as in as in rapid, right? Like in a flash, like a kind of lightning flash. That somehow flash designs were quicker to tattoo than custom designs. So that's may well be true or not, but it's not where the term comes from. Um, the actual term flash uh, comes from um, the early 20th century, and it comes from like bookmaking slang. So from horse racing, basically. And um, Flash is an, um, uh, in, in, the book, in the horse racing bookmaking sense is an abbreviation of, a, of the term Flash part, the Flash part. And the Flash part um, of a bookmaker's booth, I suppose, a turf accountant, as we'd call them, um, the Flash part would be the part that would advertise the prices, advertise the odds that this particular bookmaker was offering. Um, and it would be the basically the way that you would, as a bookie, attract customers, right? So flash there in the slang comes from flashy, meaning ostentatious, showing off, um, distinctive, uh, you know, like, yeah, enticing, basically. Um, we have similar terms in English, like you know, Flash Harry, a uh, sort of slang for someone who's a who's a bit of a wide boy. Yeah, yeah. So this, so 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 the Flash part is this banner or this display board with the uh, enticing prices, um, and that then basically m- morphs into uh, f- f- for tattooers in the early twentieth century this this term that we know and love today. It's the stuff you put in the window, the designs which would attract your customers in. Um, it also, the term also has these kind of connotations of a sort of related term, which also seems to be related to kind of bookmaking and sort of subculture of the early 20th century. There was a term flash language, meaning like um, the kind of slang, the, the vernacular of the, of, the, of, the, of the criminals of the underworld. Um, so, you know, Flash then gives us something like, you know, this beautiful, efficient vernacular visual language, which I really like, you know. Um, and also there's that interesting connection in terms of like the, at the same time, the formation of a kind of um, psychological treatment of the tattooed as connected to criminality and like that, like Flash language used by criminals, criminals that might have had tattoos and you have. Yeah, I so I so I think it's a, it's a bit later on. I think so. Lombroso is in the eighteen sixties and seventies up to the eighteen nineties, um, and and this is probably like nineteen twenties, something like that, maybe a little bit earlier. But but those connotations are definitely there, and this idea of tattooing as something a little bit not entirely kind of sub, not entirely kind of you know um, underground, but certainly kind of on the edges of acceptability, and and that kind of you know book, even bookmaking, you know, is something that. Is 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 a is a tolerated part of high society, but one that exists slightly apart from it. And I think tattooing, you're right, Tom, fits in that same category, right? And um, it, it, it's it's obviously difficult to tell or impossible to tell exactly when that term moves into the tattoo business. Um, but we can talk about when t- when when what we know of it, what we call flash today, which is pre-drawn or or even probably mass-produced mm. design sheets from which customers can select where that comes from. Yeah, and there's, a, I think there's also that kind of um, conjoined life of like bookmaking and tattooing as, like you said, these tolerated things of high, of respectable society having one foot in the economy and one foot out of it as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all that kind of romance, right, of the kind of, you know, the, the kind of dodgier ends of polite society. I think mm. that's nice. And I like this, I, I, like, I like this association with the, with the language of tattooing as well, the, lang- the flash language. Well, it, it, it um, makes sense in terms of like, when you look at it in terms of like a 
form of visual communication, it is a form of language in and of itself. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It becomes a kind of vernacular language of, of the industry for sure. Um, but the, the point being, right, so uh, t- tattoo tattoo images, you know, in, again, in, I'm talking as as always, unless otherwise specified really, uh, about Western, um, you know, Anglo-European, Anglo-Euro-American tattooing. Um, the designs that people are tattooing on their bodies or having tattooed on their bodies come from their visual culture around them. Um, and the earliest examples we have of this, you know, in terms of like a specific repeatable set of designs comes um, again from something we talked about with the uh, Razooks when we met up with them recently um, from these woodblock uh, designs. So we've got, there are extant about six or seven images of pilgrimage tattooing from the 1600s. Um, and we know from pilgrim designs, and we've talked about this before, that um, the the designs were cut into um, olive wood, uh, and they were stamped onto the uh, skin, often you know like a potato print, and then hand tattooed over. So in you know before stencils, before. Um, uh, you know, before um, any kind of acetates, it was literally just print it onto the skin like you would do a potato print and tattoo over. And it, again, maybe worth reading this um, from uh, a um, French pilgrim from 1658, uh, Jean de Tevenot. Uh, and he says, he said, quote, Christian tattooers have, this is in Jerusalem, have, quote, several wooden molds of which you may choose that which pleases you best. So you're selecting the designs you like. They fill it with coal dust and apply it to your arm, so they leave it upon the same mark of what is cut in the mould. After that, with the left hand, they take hold of your arm and stretch the skin of it, and in the right hand, they have a little cane with two needles fastened in it, which from time to time they dip, in, dip into ink, mingled with ox's gall, and prick your arm all along the lines that are marked by the wooden mould. So that gives us, I mean, right from the beginning of, of a kind of um, Western tattoo tradition, from starting from the late 15 mid to late 1500s certainly by the middle of the 17th century we've got what is really a precursor of, of flash designs now um as um anna friedman pointed out on uh, in her um in her blog uh, back in the day when she was writing about the pilgrimage tattooing on william lithgow a scottish pilgrim from 1612 that didn't preclude um custom work so lithgow asks the tattooer to add and we've talked about this before in the pod, but he asked the tattooer to add a kind of um, crown and the initials IR, Jacobus Rex, um, uh, this Protestant Reformation tattoo. Uh, so you could kind of still, even in those days, customize your designs. Um, but that, I suppose, you know, right from the beginning of professional tattooing, you have these woodblock prints. And in fact, these woodblocks are being used as designs. I mean, you know, in Jerusalem, as, as again, as the Rizuks told us, they're still being used today. but even in the early professional era in London, in the late 19th century, there's a tattooer in Portsmouth called Balsa. There's a little um, illustration of his tattooing toolkit, and he is tattooing using woodblocks um, to produce his designs. So this is a very kind of stable way of producing design images. Um, during the you know, pre-professional era, so when tattooers are, you know, when people are getting tattooed on board ships and in prisons and stuff, obviously the coincidence between images is less direct, but still these images are traced often. Um, they may not be applied directly onto the skin, but they're images which we find in other places, right? On coins, um, in handicrafts, in print sources. Um, yeah, and it's it's much more like representative of visual culture that like you see is congruent throughout like all forms in terms of, you know, um, adornment and decoration. They're, they have not necessarily made that leap yet to being like directly um, representative of a communicable idea, but they are more decorative in the same way that early tattooing that we know of was. Yeah, and they have a much more kind of, you know, straightforward visual sort of set of languages. The designs are often, you know, maritime, military, professional, um, or, um, or, or religious or romantic. Really, that's basically what you're getting. Um, and those designs are, are fairly stable. Yeah, like much like other kind of like 
decorative culture. It is generally quite parochial, and that's not to de- that's not to talk it down either. But well, it's it is a folk art. It's a folk art, right? So it has this kind yeah. of folk art stability. And, and, and as I said, the images, and I've written about this um, at some length, like the images that we find in tattooing are not unique to tattooing. You know, the pierced hearts, the the the, the, the things even that we think of as really iconically tattooed designs uh, have life worlds outside of tattooing. Um, but but when we get you know when we get to um, professional tattooing, so we're talking sort of you know the eighteen eighties basically. There's a there's a, a, an earlier you know the earliest professional tattoo studio we've identified is in the eighteen fifties in uh, America, Martin Hildebrandt. Um, but we're really talking about when we talk about the professional era. We're talking kind of uh, uh, early eighteen eighties, and there right from the beginning we we're seeing tattooers like Sutherland MacDonald and Tom Riley in London and like Samuel O'Reilly um, and uh, his kind of crew in New York, basically drawing upon print culture. So that print culture is things like um, salon pictures. So paintings by French salon artists like, like Bougereau and Falero, these kind of sexy, but kind of almost, you know, things that were mass marketed in print or engraving or etching, the kind of things that fairly wealthy or you know, upper middle class um, or even kind of lower echelons of the upper class client bases would have had prints or copies of. Um, or they're getting what, what gets called sporting pictures. So McDonald's studio in German Street, opposite it was a gallery um, who represented this artist called Archibald Thorburn. And Archibald Thorburn was like Britain's premier um, kind of sporting pictures artist. He, he did paintings of birds and hunting scenes. So lots of lots of peregrine falcons and hunting birds of prey, uh, ducks, um, all these pictures, which which again reflect the kind of visual culture of the client base of these clubby men. Uh, from the upper middle, uh, upper middle classes or lower, lower upper classes, if that it's not contradiction in terms, um, and we can see from McDonald's like there's a really great um, back piece that McDonald did of uh, uh, lifted directly from a Thorburn uh, painting, which is of a big hawk carrying a rabbit. Uh, however, in the McDonald version, he swapped the rabbit out for a stag. And it's like comically misproportioned. <laughs> um, either the either the eagle's tiny or the or the or, or the, sorry the stag is tiny or the eagle's massive. Um, either way around, but you can see so even again where there's a clear kind of lifting of mm. designs from print sources, there's a translation happening. Um, the other place actually interesting that McDonald's taking things from is like decorative art books. So um, uh, the amazing uh, tattoo scholar. Instagram page posted the other day um, uh, an illustration of something that I'd been keeping under my hat a little bit, but you know, <laughs> it's out there. Um, a lift that McDonald's had taken from Owen Jones's Grammar of Ornament, um, really interesting, massive, massive physical book. It's on Internet Archive as well of like Victorian patination. And there's a whole section on Orientalist um, and North African design. And um, there's also a section on tattooing, actually. What Owen Jones called Savage Ornament. So there's a section in that book about tattooing anyway, which is made by McDonald had a copy. But in there, there's copies of the patterns from the Alhambra, um, the Moorish um, palace in Granada. And um, McDonald uses some of those patterns for, for one of his back pieces. So these, this you know shows that those, early Vict- those late Victorian, early Edwardian tattooers are collecting, as you said, print sources. Um, and there's a sense that, um, you know, that they're also presenting them to their customers in books. So sadly, none of these survive. I mean, I'm one of my kind of holy grails and who knows, McDonald did retire before World War II started. And, um, uh, but the, the, hopefully it was removed, but the hammam where he, tattooed was bombed and, and destroyed so maybe his stuff was destroyed but anyway we know that he and other london tattooers for example had these scrapbooks basically victorian scrapbooks which they filled with designs that they cut from um theater programs um you know we're, we're, the, the beauty of the internet is we're able now to much more easily identify where these things are coming from 
salon pictures um from engravings um uh, Gemma Angel uh famously discovered a French prison tattoo that was a portrait of a baby cut from a baby food ad <laughs> <laughs> um, we find you know we find that so cl- and, and, and written descriptions as well attest to the fact that when you went into a Victorian tattooer they would they would draw you some stuff up custom for sure mm. um but Oftentimes, what we now think of as flash would be selecting from you know the kind of Pinterest of the day, basically the kind of images that these tattooists had collected from their visual life worlds from 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 magazines. Yeah, and it's kind of like this rudimentary form of like collaging the different elements of a tattoo, and the real artistry, I suppose, is taking all these disparate elements and making a a cohesive composition out of it in the same way that collage does anyway. Yeah, and that's also true. I mean, that's also something, yeah, exactly that McDonald and others are doing is that they're taking disparate sources. I mean, again, there's quite a lot of design elements and flourishes that McDonald's taking from that Grammar of Ornament book, for example, and collaging them together in order to create, um, you know, quasi-custom, quasi-unique designs, particularly when we're talking about back pieces and sleeves and front pieces and things that are meant to be much larger scale. Um, the other the the other of course reference and this is probably the link to the next section of what we want to talk about is um is Japan mm-hmm. and of course um we've talked we've talked about again on this podcast and I'm writing about in more detail the the use of hokusai and how go listen to those episodes about the frog if you want to know more about that story we won't repeat it on this episode but um the other of course key visual source here is orientalist designs by the 18 18- 90s probably not so much things straightly straight coming from Japan, but also books, prints, popular reproductions of works of people like Kuniyoshi, Hokusai, mm. um, uh, Utagawa, and other Japanese artists, which again can be collaged into Orientalist, Oriental-ish looking designs. Mm. And that, that's again one of the reasons why European versions of Japanese or Orientalist tattooing mm. don't look like tattooing in Japan is because European Orientalist tattooing is taken from remixes of print sources. Mm-hmm. It's a, a to quote Baudrillard, a simulacra. Yeah. Hey, are you enjoying the show? If you really like Beneath the Skin and you want to help support us. You can do so on Patreon. For little as five quid a month, you can help make this show possible, help us buy research materials. So if you like the show and you want to support us, consider kicking us a few quid a month and you'll get everything from bonus episodes to Q&As and you can even vote on what tattoo I'll get when we reach a certain subscriber count. Matt, have you got anything to say? You should really definitely uh, fund the Patreon because tattoo history is massive, right? Deep, wide, complicated. We're covering some big hit topics on the main feed, but on the Patreon subscriber-only feed, we'll be getting into some really more interesting, niche, deep topics you don't want to miss out on. And honestly, the chance to kind of decide what Thomas gets on his body is probably just a once in a lifetime opportunity. Subscribe, chuck us a few quid. Don't miss out on the chance to ruin Thomas's body forever. What, but what, when we're transitioning out of this kind of like late 1910s, early 1920s into what we would consider when you t- talk to someone about like early flash, when they think about like, you know, Jerry's studio, Burt Grimm, like the like where you're seeing the walls of the set designs. Where's that leap in between them? Yeah, so um, we do have um, so uh, the, early in the 20th century, even in the late 19th century, um, tattooers are starting to sell tattoo supply kits. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, for example, Frank de Berg, the American performing tattooed man, is selling tattoo equipment in London. Um, uh, we have, for example, Daniel Purdy um, selling a house tattoo kit by mail in the 1890s. Early 20th century in the UK, people like Joseph Hartley as well. Um, in the US, it's obviously people like Percy Waters um, who are selling tattoo equipment by mail so that will basically be instructions on how to make hand needle bars i i guess we'd call them um little instruction booklets uh, and then primarily sheets of pre-produced designs and this is something that becomes possible with the birth of you know um 
fairly cheap or accessible reproduction technologies for designs. So um, electrostatic uh, reproduction, for example, lithographs, all that kind of stuff. So those designs, basically, those tattooers start selling um, stencils, basically, pre-produced designs for home tattooers to use. And there's a really interesting, um, for example, uh, flash book, we'd call it today, by a tattooer who was working on board a Royal Navy ship in Malta uh, in 1911 or so. And it's very clear that the designs in his flash book are taken from the stencils that he's bought from Joseph Hartley. So though very, very quickly, those early, late 19th century, early 20th century, cheaply reproduced design sheets are getting into the hands of amateur tattooers. They're not, the, I think they're not going to be up on the walls really for um, a good while. F- yeah, for a good while. Professional tattooers are either painting designs, that begins to happen, um, or they are getting other people to paint designs and they're buying hand painted designs mm-hmm. from the early 19th century. This is something which comes from, um, again, Japan. And I think like this is something. Um, it's worth kind of quoting uh, Ed Hardy on this. So, so um, Hardy, there's a really great book um, on Mike Malone on Rollo, who's an important figure. We'll come to in a second um, in this histories of Flash. But but Hardy points out um, that the the real real inspiration for these Flash books is from the traveling tattooers in Japan in the again in the kind of late 19th, early 20th century. So these guys. Um, forced by, again, listen to our other episodes, but forced by circumstance to tattoo uh, itinerantly to leave Japan or or, or to work only on European sailors are are producing books full of designs that they can, that their customers can pick from and that they can Mm. tattoo quickly. So Japanese tattooing, of course, had been fairly large scale, um, but when the necessity comes to tattoo European clients, they have to find designs that will be able to be tattooed quickly. Um, there again comes that association with with uh, with rapidity, right? With flash. Mm. And again, I've spoken about this on on the pod. But when I went to Japan uh, last year and I saw these design books from 1904 by a, a tattooer called Ikasaki, and in that book he basically says, "Like these are my designs for European uh, customers." And they're beautifully painted, but they're exclusively two color. They're basically black and red. So the two colors that are available to, and shades of those colors that are available to to, to, to be tattooed. And they're, they're small and the kind of thing that could basically, most of them could be done in one session. Um, and the other interesting thing about this, and this is something that Hardy points out, is that they materially, as drawings, replicate the kind of... Um, materiality of of tattooing in the skin so they are on they're on heavy absorbent paper stock and painted with watercolor and this is really really important because again to quote um hardy flash strives to re- re- represent how the tattoo will appear in the skin and it's painted in ink and watercolor use, usually using a round tip lettering pen for the lines this evokes a circular cluster of needles used for outlining ideally producing a consistent line no matter which way the machine tracks. And the shading is also kind of what, what, we, what um, tattoo is called spit shading, so moistened on a moistened brush, diluted by, by licking the brush. Yep. And as, to, as to quote Hardy, all colours are more or less fugitive in the skin. So <clears throat> the specific pens and brushes and inks used to paint early Japanese travel book flash you know travel book designs for european customers is where we get the language of flash design modern flash line painted flash line from because as a technique it allows you to see on paper sort of what a tattoo will look like in the skin i think that's not that amazing and also it connects to a very current point as well as in that tension of when you see a lot of apprentices people are split down the middle on whether apprentices should learn how to draw flash on an iPad or on uh, sheets of paper. And this argument is generally what people say in favor of like not using an iPad is that painting it on card and on very heavy paper will get you used to like 
how it will look and will train you better in the long run versus like the technological ease of designing on an iPad. Yeah, exactly right. And I think that's one of the reasons why so much digital tattooing looks so weird, I think, because it's been drawn in a way that isn't sympathetic to the medium. Um, again, let me quote this from from um, from Hardy. So uh, he says, traditionally, two brushes are used, one loaded with colour, the other dipped in water in the artist's mouth to be moistened to just the right degree. This secondary brush is used to draw out gradations from a wet area of solid pigment. Thus, spit shading was created, giving tattoo flash its disting- distinguished look. Um, as, uh, and then he says, classical dis- tattoo designs reflect no real light source. Graphic impact is created with shading that emphasizes the forms. A skillful tattooer manipulates the machine to achieve a variety of tonalities with black ink and color. The fade effect or smooth shading is actually created with half-tone pattern by the minuscule needles that ca- carry pigment into the dermis. And I think it goes on to, to, to make this point about the link between those these Japanese books and, and the birth of, of flash painting. So there's a really interesting technological thing happening here. Um, and yeah, as we start getting these developments, um, it starts to become really important. And basically, as tattooing is changing, so in you know basically in the run-up to World War I, tattooing is falling out of favor with the upper classes becoming more popular with the with the, the lower middle classes and the lower classes and that means it's cheaper which means it's quicker and the more the more tattooers you the more tattoos you, a tattooer can do in a day the more money they're going to make right so flash again like speeds up the process it helps um it helps kind of you know make the whole process a, a lot more straightforward um so the real kind of pioneer of what we now call flash Sheets um, is a guy called uh, Lou the Jew Alberts. So Lou uh, Lou Alberts, who who was called uh, born Albert Kurtzman, um, began commercial production designs in about 1905. He, he'd been a wallpaper designer, and so had mm-hmm. access to mass production printing technology. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some disagreement uh, in the literature about whether or not he. Um, had permission to use these other these other tattooers' designs? <laughs> probably not. Probably, probably not. not. Um, but actually, before you go on, that that brings us. To, I think something that we've discussed on the show before, like a brilliant point of like in terms of like designing the flash. How do you stop it from being stolen when like someone can just go and photocopy it, or in the case now, take a screenshot of it, redraw it, do it very badly. And Sailor Jerry kind of came up with the perfect solution to it. Yeah, so Jerry, Jerry, um, apparently produced what gets called in in the um, in map make uh, in um, uh, directory making um, like mondegreens. Have you heard this term? So no, mondegreens. Um, the, the term arises from um, publishers of telephone books and street directories because you can't copyright information, right? So information is not copyrightable um, per se. You can only copy copyright kind of organization of information and so in order to prove you know and of course one street directory is going to look in terms of the information much the same as another one so how do you protect the effort and energy that you've got into mapping a whole city one of the ways that um publishers did that was put in fake streets um so that if it showed up in a rival's um you know telephone book uh it would um it would basically end up, uh, you know, you could tell it was copied. Um, and this is, it's the same with cartography. And also, uh, weirdly enough, uh, the reason why recipes online essentially have an essay before you get to the actual recipe is this. You can't copyright information. So yeah. you have to insert some sort of creative work beforehand so someone can't just like directly copy and paste your recipe onto their own site. Sorry, I've complete Mondegreen's something different. It's a mount weasel. That's the term I'm looking for. Oh, okay, a Monde- fair. A Monde- Ironically, a Mondegreen is a misheard phrase or saying. <laughs> so there we go. We've, we're learning today. I was like, "Am I right?" It's called no. I, I was that was me. Mis- yeah, um, a Mondegreen is a mis- misunderstood or misinterpreted word or phrase. Um, so there we go. I've just given you a Mondegreen by talking about mount weasels. No, yeah, mount so- weasels is the term. So 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 Sailor Jerry created these mount weasels. Um, basically by creating errors in his flash. So if you had a fake copy of his line work, you would um, 
you would m- basically tattoo it wrong. Bits of the anatomy would be joined up wrong. Um, there's all kinds of kind of examples. But if you bought it from him, he'd give you the key and tell you how you know, where the errors were so you could fix them. Um, which I think is brilliant. Um, so, so, so Lee the Jew is tattooing, yeah, f- from uh, uh, around 1905, um, and then Waters, for example, after him and, and and Hartley and others like set up more commercial uh, supply companies. Um, uh, like, so that that's really that, those kind of uh, and and that thus the kind of design language of tattooing begins to solidify. But also with Flash. Um, you're able, of course, then to tattoo if you can't draw. Mm-hmm. Um, and so being able to draw <laughs> <laughs> being able to draw becomes less of a requirement um for for becoming a professional tattooer. So yeah, um you know, once uh, I think Water sets up his his company in the twenties and Hartley uh, had been going slightly before then. This basically means that if you're a tattoo and, and um the other the other actually interesting guy is um Charles Davis Burchett, so George Burchett's brother. Um, George Burchett's brother uh, is also supplying designs, um, and this—I mean, these these designs themselves are also kind of you know often drawn from print sources, but they are now and also drawn from each other. So as soon as a, a tattoo gets published or circulated in these photo trading networks, for example, it becomes flash and reproducible. Um, so. Yeah, that thus the kind of language of tattooing bec- starts to become much more solidified because there's more tattooers, but few of them are able to kind of produce custom designs. And in fact, you know, by the 1920s, Sutherland MacDonald is uh, writing in a letter that we have um, to a, a friend in America, basically saying, I'm not even bothering coming in anymore. I'm, you know, no one wants the stuff I'm doing. Plenty of other tattooers are too bit are really busy, but they're like Burchett doing smaller designs. Um, and then kind of, I suppose what we see is that transition into the kind of the more commercial aspect of Flash, which, you know, we can talk about Rollo, we can talk about Spalding and Rogers, where... Yeah, well, the, fir- the first the first real, like, step up then is, is Milton Zeiss. Um, and we, men- <laughs> and we-, <laughs> we mentioned him in the Phil Sparrow episode, right? Um, yeah, we'll talk about cause... him more favorably today. Yeah, we'll... we'll- Sparrow, although Sparrow ended up writing and working for him a little bit, basically sort of thought he was a hack because he was the <laughs> Sparrow. He says was you know, he by his own account was the only person ever to finish Zeiss's course. Zeiss was a tattooer and and showman and sort of peripatetic traveling artiste um, from Illinois. And in 1936, inspired by Waters, he set up his own Zeiss studio. Um, and really kind of professionalized what Waters was doing. Again, reproduction technology was much more um, available. He'd av- he advertised how to tattoo courses in, in popular mechanics and produced these really flashy, beautiful, beautiful um, uh, you know, sheets of, of flash. There, there's a beautiful book, a series of books actually by um, Yellow Beak Press, which have republished a lot of these and and all kinds of stuff. Um, so Zeiss, Zeiss, really, really important, sp- spreading these designs. And these then were sheets which would then be hung up in tattoo shops, um, and they would be then available for others. Um, and and again, to quote Hardy uh, here, most tattooers, through lack of skill, inclination, or necessity, worked from what the customer had to choose from. Mm-hmm. And also, you have this period of, you know, post-war economic growth. People have more disposable income. Tattoo artists are probably getting more walk-ins, and it's right. less like people organizing a session to That's come. That's exactly so right. If someone's coming in off the street, you need to grab their attention. You're going to put it up on the wall. They're going to look. They're going to. I want that. Yeah, and if you've got the best flash, if you've got the best designs, people are going to be coming in. Um, there's a we'll talk to Terry Manton more about this guy, but there's a really interesting guy in the UK called um, called Alex Colville Gordon, who's an American who'd come to Britain, and he was his flash is a beautiful hand painted designs, but it's been credited to the people who was using it. So people like um, uh, Cecil Rhodes in Dover and. Um, uh, Harry Battle and Paddington and 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 various others uh, are all having credited uh, with this beautiful flash painting. But it was all done by this guy Alex Gordon. But Alex Gordon, <laughs> his work was absolutely, you know, stunning. And another guy in London at the time, um, George Bigmore, is another really interesting 
painter. And if you've got beautiful flash designs that stand out, you're going to get people through the doors in in that period. I mean, we talked about Jessie Knight, for example, one of the reasons that she was so envied by her peers is she had this incredible collection of flash designs, uh, American ones um, from, from, from Sporting and Rogers and Chicago Tattoo Supply from people like Alec Gordon um, uh, and others. So your flash really made you. In fact, there's this term, which you may have heard, pork chop sheet. Um, and, and flash designs got sold as pork chop sheets because they're the, they're the ones that make you so much money you could afford pork on a Friday. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So goes that. So goes that term. It, the, other, the other interesting kind of counter um, uh, effect of this, this is something I, I, I've argued in the, in the new book that uh, I'm just finishing up, um, is that this, allow, this makes Western tattooing become really standardized. So we get this very kind of limit, starting to get a very limited set of motifs. But by turn, that allows Orientalist tattooing, quote unquote tribal tattooing, non Western tattooing to become strange again. Because it's it's very visually different and and very kind of um, different in scale and different in design from the stuff that's very familiar. Tattooing as a practice had long ceased to be strange. I mean, it was never tolerated or accepted exactly, but it was certainly not anything entirely novel. But I think one of the reasons why there's this post-war um, anxi- anxiety about tattooing in general is that tattooing becomes strange again. Um, flash flash allows. Western tattooing has become very familiar. And so when sailors and soldiers are getting tattooed or seeing tattooing in India, in Burma, um, in the Pacific, they are surprised by it all over again in a way that had sort of not happened for probably a generation. And ironically, kind of tattooing, it seems to constantly reinvent itself in order to be strange and shocking and weird all the time. Like every, it seems like there's always like every decade or so or however many years there's always this new trend that is like an affront to sensibilities i suppose you could call it that's right yeah exactly and i think flash is an interesting kind of part of that right that it it, it, it makes some some kind of kind of tattooing a bit more familiar um mm. and at the same time beca- turns other kinds of tattooing by by contrast to stuff that's a bit stranger um yeah it's so this- you know the the underground being subsumed into the mainstream then leave space for something else to come up yeah exactly and and, and i think you know so this this period in the 50s uh, 40s and 50s is really interesting we have as you mentioned sporting and rogers for example um uh, who've been producing flash since 1956 um it, it, it's a really interesting moment and of course like Producing designs becomes also a way for tattooers to make money, um, along as mm-hmm. well as you know, alongside their own practice. So, so Jerry is a, is a, is another example of that out in out in Hawaii. Someone you know, someone who's 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 taking designs that had been produced by the artists whose whose designs had been taken for those previous generations of suppliers. People like Owen Jensen, uh, people like uh, Brooklyn Joe Lieber, and kind of remixing them, reappropriating them, reproducing them, resharing them. And I think one of the reasons why tattooing is such a um, magpie art, right? Like this kind of uh, art form, which is constantly related to copying and reproduction and, and, and has this kind of limited design vocabulary is because of the, the, the circulation of design sheets and the circulation of design. Because of course, when, some, when, when particular designs become popular or normative, then they become fashionable and then they become the thing that everyone else wants and then they become the, the, the pierced hearts and, and swallows and daggers and the things and black panthers, you know, sick-ass panthers that we really associate with the, um, with the trade. So these designs which originate elsewhere become tattoo designs through flash circulation, right? Mm-hmm. And we also have the kind of the re in influx of eastern influences through you know the trading of designs by pinky yun towards you know sailor jerry and back and forth and everything kind of is melting together yeah and 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 melting together on paper as much as on Mm -hmm. uh, on on skin right which i find super interesting and of course like all of these designs um are themselves related to trends and modes in their mode of reproduction so in those early days when tattooers are copying from engravings or when even early you know flash or proto flash design sellers like uh, Purdy 
are producing and Hartley are producing designs. They are thin lined. They're, they're copied from things that have been produced by, you know, copied from engraving or lithograph. Um, when you get to someone like Cap Coleman in the 1940s, the flash designs and the popular design sheets there have thick, heavy lines because they're traced from comic books and graphic novels. And comic books, because they're produced in cheap four color mode, have heavy lines so that if the printing, color printing plates are misaligned, slightly misregistered is the technical term, they're not going to go outside the lines. You have a thick black line to give yourself a little bit of wriggle room when you're doing cheap mass produced um, four color print. So the reason comic books have thick black lines is because that's how they were printed. And the reason why tattooing Mm -hmm. in the 40s and the 30s begins to have heavy black lines is because those tattooers are copying the print sources and the flash producers are reproducing those images in the same way. And it, and you know, it, it, it comes full circle of the point that, you know, these designs are coming from what's around artists. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to take it from these design motifs of kind of folk art to, uh, you know, encyclopedias about botanical drawings and anatomical drawings to what is the new cultural influx it's comic books during you know that period so what do what are people gonna draw are gonna draw off comic books because what do people want to get they want to get superman or stuff from comic books yeah no i i i think this is kind of you know a perfect place to leave it for now we we're going to do a part two of kind of starting with late 60s then malone and moving up to now because i feel like we we could probably sit here for hours and talk about this. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like I, I think if you're to take anything away from this first episode, is you know, Flash has always been a representation of what surrounds both the artists and the customer. Yeah, and it and it's what connects tattooing to everything else around it. Now, again, as I said for for tattoo people, most of people most people listening to this podcast will be tattoo people. This seems really obvious. But if you think about how tattooing has been conceptualized, uh, you know, even in the kind of popular media, certainly in the academic literature, it's always something as something separate. But as we talked about in more detail in that episode about Hawker Size Frog, it is print culture. It is graphic culture from the visual culture landscape or the visual culture context which is driving tattoo trend, it's driving tattoo development, it's driving tattoo appearance, as we as we just mentioned with with these, you know, this this what seems like a very technical tattoo thing about line weight is ultimately reproducible down to um down to technology. So flash, I think, and, and the visual language of tattooing and its particularity and its and its ubiquity is actually the thing that is the key for me and was the key when I first became a tattoo historian of connecting tattooing to everything around it. Like there is a reason that people in the 1930s are getting tattoos of Mickey Mouse and portraits of Gary Cooper, right? Um, and there is a reason why people in the 19th century are getting tattoos of of dragons and Hokusai frogs and peregrine falcons. Um, mm. It's because those are the images that they love. And again, as we've mentioned on a few occasions um, in our pinup episode, in our, uh, you know, when we talked about the Tasmanian devil um, with cartoon tattoos, like th- this relationship between the visual culture and, and, and tattooing is something that's really profound and important. Uh, and one mm. of the reasons that tattooing is comprehensible in the terms of art history, you know, as I always say, I'm not going to kind of, I don't think it's necessary to call tattooing an art form. It's not what art historians do, but <laughs> it's, it's connection. It's connection to the visual culture context from which it emerges is exactly why this is such an interesting topic, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you enjoyed this episode, we will be doing part two in two weeks time um, where we'll be talking about, you know, from late 60s, early 70s until now. But uh, yeah, we got to talk about Cherry Creek. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but um, since uh, we are at the end of the episode, I want to thank Matt for being here. If you enjoyed this episode, maybe consider checking us out on patreon we post all our episodes there so you get episodes like this you also get two extra episodes a month for as little as three pounds a month you can get one for fiver you can get two not 
Fiverr doesn't get you a whole lot uh, nowadays. Uh, inflation, <laughs> all that. Um, we have other tiers at our 15, 15 pound tier. Matt will send you a signed copy of his book, Painted People. And uh, at the 10, for 10 pounds or more, um, you also get a shout out. So without further ado, I want to thank, uh, so I want to thank Stephen McCann, Roy Huxema, Morpheus Ravenna, Chris Block, Charlie Lightning, Baba Vextra, Shit Jesus, Shh, uh, Lupe Calderon, uh, Garnica, Kirsten Wright, Kathleen Burkhardt, James Schick, Dylan, and DD South. Um, thank you to all of our ten pound and above patrons. Thank you to all of our patrons, whether you're you. a paid subscriber, free subscriber, enjoy the show. If you don't have the spare scratch to kick us a few quid a month, maybe consider leaving us a review or sharing one of your favorite episodes with a friend. Um Follow us on Instagram. It's Beneath Skin Pod. We post cool shit there that's not on the episodes. You get all the announcements there first. And if you are going to Brighton Tattoo Convention at the end of February, we will be there. We will have the wonderful Sammy Hellride tattooing 50s and 60s and 40s flash at our booth. So why not take a little bit of history home yeah. with you? Authentic uh, designs, largely drawn from the Jesse Knight collection, I think, which includes Sporting and Rogers designs and uh, Chicago Tattoo Supply designs and things from Canadian flash painters like Speedy Robinson. And yeah, well, like there'll, there'll be loads of cool, cool stuff um, drawn from authentic historical sources. And we will have a very ex- Brighton exclusive uh, long sleeve t-shirt uh, designed by one Sammy Hellride. We will be posting pictures of that very soon. But uh, without uh, belaboring the point, I want to thank you all for listening. And thank you, Matt. Thank you. Bye. Bye.